<laughs> anyway, um, order of the start of tonight is um, something that came out in the Sydney Morning Herald yesterday. Uh, one of the journalists there noted that uh, sitting uh, on company balance sheets in the United States is approximately $1 trillion worth of cash. And the SMH followed that up with a report from Elizabeth Knight today suggesting that there's about $100 billion sitting on Australian companies' uh, balance sheets. Uh, I guess the question is, should that money be given back to the shareholders? I guess the supposition underlying that uh, cash reserves the fact that obviously the company is waiting for the economy to turn around and then obviously to put that cash to use in, in worthwhile investments. But if the things are still looking pretty bleak at the moment and there are no worthwhile investments, should they just give it back to the shareholders? Tim, I guess the fear for most analysts is the fact that, uh, you know, given, I guess, uh, records over the last few years, companies might squander the cash on projects that aren't considered worthwhile that don't have a, uh, a minimal net present value. Yeah, that, that's absolutely a, a risk that investors need to be cognizant of and part of the investment decision in any company uh, should be, and certainly it is the case with us. It's coming to a view as to whether you think management will behave appropriately in relation to capital allocation. Uh, so. Yeah, that, that's a legitimate concern. But stepping back to the you know, your, your initial point about mm -hmm. there being a, an amount of money uh, being withheld from shareholders, I think for anyone to arrive at a number like that, there's an assumption that's been made as to what is the correct amount of cash or the correct amount of, of debt for a business to, to have. Uh, and that's, that's really a, a matter of judgment. There's no right answer there. And in, in some cases, uh, I'm sure there are companies that are, have got more cash than they can sensibly use. Uh, in others, in other cases, it, it may just be that the company is being prudent, having regard to the, you know, the the nature of their business and the and the risk in their business. And as investors, our preference is generally to favour companies that have low levels of debt, so companies that that sort of keep the cash themselves rather yep. than paying it out to to shareholders. Um, and the reason for that is that it, it, it just lowers the the risk, and you know you can increase the, the EPS and you can increase the return by leveraging up and, uh, and, and taking on debt. Um, but at the same time, you increase the, the risk of the, the, the profit stream and it's not certain that you've actually created any value in, in doing that. So we're, we're happy when companies uh, are cautious in mm -hmm. relation to debt. Uh, and it's also the case that investors can, can gear up themselves if, if they really want to. There's, there's, there's plenty of scope for an investor to take a lightly geared company uh, fund their investment partially with debt and, and arrive at the same outcome. So we, we think you know, we're, we're reluctant to be too harsh on companies that are uh, cautious when it comes to uh, cash and debt. Absolutely. I guess over the, uh, the months we might see uh, a bit more agitation from the shareholders uh, wondering where that cash is going to be put. Uh, yeah, we, we may do. We, it, it hasn't really been something that shareholders have, have done very much of since the GFC and I, I think yeah. prior to the GFC there was a sense that you know, nothing can go wrong and you know, give us the cash. and lever up. Um, since the GFC, I think people have got a better appreciation that there, you know, there, there's a, some virtue in having a, a margin of safety in your capital structure. It's a risky world out there, it isn't is. it? All right, let's go to our first caller. We have Helen from Sydney. Helen, are you there? I am indeed. How are you, gentlemen? Well, thank you. How are you? Um, I'm ringing, of course, what else about Macmillan Shakespeare. Yep. Um, I bought in today at eight o'clock. Um, um, $8. Mm -hmm. um, I was just thinking what your panel thinks the outlook is for the company. Um, certainly a very topical share at the moment. Uh, we saw it open up this morning after a trading halt down around 50%. Uh, Tim, is it going to bounce back? Uh, yeah, uh, Helen, this, this is uh, I think one of the most interesting things we've seen on the, uh, the equity market for quite some time. Um, and it, it is probably worth stepping through the, the, the thinking in, in relation to valuing Macmillan Shakespeare because uh, I think there are some um, you know, points in relation to that valuation that, that are probably quite useful for, for people to understand. Um, we, uh, as background to this, I should point out that we hold a position in Macmillan Shakespeare. We held a, a modest position prior to uh, today, um, uh, so we've been very interested in developments, not a, a large enough position to uh, give us a, a huge amount of concern, but enough to, to keep us interested. And we studied pretty closely what has been happening over the, um, the last uh, week or so with the proposed changes to the FBT legislation. And where we came out this morning is, is, is as follows. If the proposed regulatory changes or the, the changes proposed by the Rudd government are implemented, the impact to Macmillan Shakespeare's business is devastating. The valuation in those circumstances, we think, you know, could easily start with a, with a five. Uh, however, 
if those changes are not implemented, then the business is, is largely intact uh, and it, it, it may conceivably even benefit as more people have become aware of the potential benefits of salary packaging. Uh, competitors have laid off staff and so they, they will be in a relatively weaker position whereas Macmillan and Shakespeare is retaining its staff. Um, if the changes are not implemented, the value is, is still very much intact. So the, the question really with Macmillan and Shakespeare becomes an assessment of what is the likelihood that those changes will be implemented. Uh, and what you end up with is, is two valuations, one which is say five or six dollars, the other which is you know, 15, 16 dollars. Uh, and to work out the valuation, you need to probability weight those, those two different outcomes. Taking into account the likelihood that Labor will win the election and the likelihood that they'll be able to pass the changes even if they're in power, we think that the likelihood of the changes taking effect is probably less than 20%. What that means is we get to a probability weighted valuation for Macmillan Shakespeare of $14 and this morning when it opened at $7 we were buying with our ears pinned back. Let's go to Matthew from Brisbane. Matthew, are you there? Uh, yeah, g'day guys. I've just got a general market question. Yep. Uh, directed at the Montgomery fund manager. Yes, that's I follow Tim. Roger Montgomery on web, uh, his website and Twitter and he speaks to Tiggy Fulton on the ABC One show mm -hmm. as well. Yep. I noticed he's been uh, getting involved in a lot of negative commentary lately. Um, there was a four minute interview which he tweeted his followers today that said super investors get ready to take a bath and uh, making comments like we're heading for a recession and all this neg uh, very negative commentary. I was just wondering why the Montgomery fund managers and Roger Montgomery get out of saying all these negative comments which don't really breed any positive um, sentiment in the market. And it, and it comes across that they make these negative comments when they've got a lot of money in cash. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any correlation there. Okay, well, let's go straight to Tim and uh, get uh, the Montgomery view. Um, yeah, but Matthew, look, fair, fair question, and, and clearly there is a, a correlation. We've we've got a lot of money in cash because we we hold the view that um, yeah the values uh, are not sufficiently attractive for us to deploy that cash. Uh, I think um, the, the the thing that you you need to consider is whether we have a properly thought out rationale for the, the views that we're expressing um, and you know, if you come to the view that we're expressing a, a negative view without foundation then you should absolutely uh, ignore that and, uh, and buy accordingly. Uh, but if you come to the view that we have actually thought through the, um, you know, the rationale that we're, we're giving and we genuinely hold that view. Um, then you should you know, potentially take on board what we're saying and, and think about what that means for your own investment position. And, and what I would say there is that in the not too distant past we have had uh, a lot of capital deployed in the market uh, reflecting our view that there was some, some value there and when asked the question we, that's what we've said, we can, uh, we can see good value. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I don't think people can be too critical if we're giving a, an honest assessment of the, uh, the way we, we see things uh, and that view will yeah, reflect uh, positivity when we, we think values are good and it will reflect negatively when we, uh, we think there are reasons to be concerned. And uh, just to give an example of that uh, type of scenario, pre-GFC, um, there are actually a number of people highlighting the risks in the American economy, especially with the subprime lending crisis or the subprime lending uh, area. Uh, but they were largely ignored because there was too much bullish news coming out, the markets were racing ahead, they're hitting all-time highs. Uh, and uh, as a result, people claimed that they had no idea, they couldn't see the GFC coming. Well, actually there were plenty of warning signs, red flags out there. Yeah. Um, let's hope that if there is a recession, Montgomery proves to be one of those red flags. Exactly. And, and one, one final point, which is, is probably the really important thing to take away uh, from this for um, you know, all, all viewers, when you hear a, a view being given on by us or by anyone else, don't, don't just accept the, the view because you, you like or, or dislike the person giving it. Think about the rationale, think about the reasons that they're giving for that view and come to your own uh, conclusions as to whether they're, they're valid reasons and a, a properly structured um, point of view. Okay, let's go to Peter from Newcastle. Peter, are you there? So I am. Oh, far away. Yeah, um, 
Just a question for Tim. I must disclose my involvement. I've got some money with uh, with Monty Fun. Thanks very much to Tim and crew. Um, with uh, I've got some. Uh, I couldn't give all the money to you. I had to play around with it a little bit. Um, and I'm I'm in the IT space. MTU. I've been doing quite nicely as it's been fluctuating and buying more as it pulls back. I've got a bit left in NXT. Should I leave it there or maybe move it across into MTU next time it drops down? Okay. Uh, look, N NXT, I know less about. Um, MTU, uh, if you're one of our investors, you, you may know uh, that we, uh, we own it and uh, have done for some time. It's been a, um, you know, a great investment for us. Uh, we think the Dodo and FTEL um, acquisitions have added something to the, uh, to the value and it's, it's a business that has created a lot of value over a long period of time. Uh, at the current price, it is, is looking like fair value, so I, I think the right strategy is to buy more of it when it, uh, when it does uh, pull back, uh, rather than wading in too heavily at the moment. Um, now, NXT, I've just, just realised that's Next DC, which is the, um, the, the company that has been uh, building data centres with a, a national footprint at a, uh, at a rapid rate. Um, Next DC is um, it, it's certainly an interesting prospect. It, it's not one that we have invested in um, so far. It, it, it's yet to become profitable, uh, and it's hard to have a sense on value. Um, our best guess is that it, it's it's not fabulously uh, cheap, um, but I, I don't have you know, enough of a sense of that one to to tell you. Yeah, that it, it, it's definitely a, a better or a, or a worse bet than uh, MTU. Uh, I do think that um, you know, the telcos have been volatile, and if you if you see MTU fall back again, as it as it has done a, a couple of times uh, in the last little while, um, that's probably a good opportunity to to buy that one. Um, NXT, I, I, I can't um, advise you with uh, with any kind of confidence about the uh, the valuation for that one. Well, let's go straight to our next caller, and it's Dan from Sydney. Dan, are you there? Yeah, hi, hi, I'm here. I just want to find out whether, is it a good time to purchase uh, carsales.com? Certainly. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's go to Tim first off. Car sales, very good business. It Very is, good model. Yeah, one of the best businesses um, on the ASX, uh, we think, and one that we would love to be able to own at the right price. Uh, we don't think the current price is the, the right price. It, it just, looks, um, just looks too expensive uh, at the moment for us. Um, that's not to say that the price won't continue to go up because really, really good businesses um, often will do that. They will trade well above you know, fair value for a long period of time and that you know, the price will continue to rise as the value grows. Um, so it, it's, it's a hard one to tell. For us, uh, we, we can't buy it at the, at the current price. Um, but that's when you say it's so expensive, you're talking about the PE ratio? I'm talking about the, the, our assessment of its, its intrinsic value rather yep. than the, the PE ratio. And our, our valuation takes into account the, you know, the long-term stream of cash flows that we think the, the business will generate. Mm -hmm. um, it trades on a very high PE ratio. It's um, yeah, 27 times 2013, but it, it's a great quality business. It earns a fantastic ROE, very strong cash flows, and it deserves a high PE ratio. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess what I'm saying is that that's too high um, sure. from our point of view. Yeah. Clive writes, can I get the panel's opinion of BHP Billiton's exports to China being at yet another all-time high? Uh, let's start with the fundamentals first off. Tim. Yeah, uh, uh, Clive, I, I'm not, uh, <laughs> this is an email question, so Clive, you're, you're maybe not listening. Uh, but I'm not, not sure if by all-time high you mean um, the value or the, the volumes. I, I'm presuming that you mean the, the values, which is a... Uh, Actually, I think you might be referring to the volumes. The volumes, yeah. okay. Uh, well, the... I guess the explanation for that is that BHP, like uh, Rio, like um, yeah, a host of other similar businesses, have invested very, very heavily recently in expanding their capacity, uh, and it's you know, inevitable that the volume of exports rises substantially as a result. Um, that's great if the demand is there to meet it. If the demand is not there to meet it, then it's, it's disastrous. You've got a lot of capital invested that you can't earn a decent return on. Everyone else is flooding the market with additional volume, which drives the price down. Uh, so yeah, the, the real concern is where, you know, where do you see the demand over the, uh, the next few years? Is it sufficient to soak up this you know, additional production? Uh, we're concerned that it may not be, um, so we're a little bit reluctant on this one. Yeah, I guess it's a bit of a two-edged sword, isn't it? On the one hand, the volumes are up, yep. but of course that means that's going to drive the price down. Yeah, and it's, yeah. It's, it, if you get the timing right, if you have the volume going up when the demand is there, that's fantastic. But these companies systematically don't get it right. They invest when the prices are high, 
uh, and the volume comes on when it's it's too late as a as a general rule. So, uh, and we yeah, and we think that's probably what's happening in this case.